Well, good morning. Thank you for coming to today's presentation, which is titled The Haitian Revolution and the Making of the Modern World. Our speaker is Dr. Robert Tabor, an assistant professor of history at Fayetteville State University in North Carolina, where he has taught courses on U.S., French, African American, Latin American, and world history since 2016. Dr. Tabor is a specialist in family life in colonial and revolutionary Haiti. He completed his PhD in Latin American history at the University of Florida, where he met our own Dr. Bill Fisher. Dr. Bill Fisher brought his colonial Latin American class to today's Zoom presentation, if you're watching via Zoom. Dr. Tabor has published articles and essays on Haiti and co-edited the book titled Free Communities of Color and the Revolutionary Caribbean, Overturning or Turning Back. From August 2003 to February 2004, he lived in Haiti full time doing volunteer work. Today's presentation is the first of three talks that Dr. Tabor is presenting during our Caribbean semester. On Wednesday, October 28th, he will be discussing the story of the Haitian Revolution and the coming of the U.S. Civil War at 12 noon. And at 1 p.m., he will be discussing foreign aid. Who is it good for? Again, those two Zoom presentations are on October 28th. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Tabor. Thank you. It's, it's good to be with you all. Uh, this morning, and um, I thank Professor Stebbins, Professor Fisher, uh, Kyle Van, and the rest of the Missouri Southern State University uh, faculty and staff for the opportunity to address you today uh, as part of your Caribbean semester. It's really great. I was sharing uh, with Professor Stebbins how I've shared uh, content created by Missouri Southern with my History of Latin America class uh, this semester that you've done various, the university's done various projects uh, centered around public history and educating um, the broader world community about itself, about the world. And that's fantastic. I'm really impressed at the leadership the university is showing in integrating international studies into the curriculum. This is a vital aspect of becoming and being prepared global citizens. Today, as we start talking about the Haitian Revolution um, and talk about its position it, as a fulcrum in the creation of the modern world, I bring your attention to this painting, uh, which often finds itself on the cover of textbooks or inside textbooks because of its striking juxtapositions. On the right, we have Jean-Baptiste Ballet. Ballet was born in Senegal on the west coast of Africa in the 1740s and was enslaved and transported across the Atlantic in the crossing or the Middle Passage uh, while he was still a toddler. He grew up enslaved in colonial Haiti or French Saint-Domingue, eventually purchasing his freedom, which was a rare occurrence. About one to 2% of people who were enslaved in colonial Haiti would have had the chance uh, to become free through legal means. During the tumult of the interlinked French and Haitian revolutions, he climbed the ranks of the French National Guard uh, becoming an infantry captain, and then when the colony elected deputies to the French National Assembly, itself a revolutionary measure, this was the first time the colonies had representation in a European legislature, uh, they elected Ballet, along with a man of mixed race descent and a white colonist to represent them. In Paris, Ballet championed the idea of universal emancipation. Uh, he fought for ending slavery across the French colonies, much the objection of deputies from other colonial territories who demanded special laws, objecting that in essence, men such as Ballet didn't know how things really worked in the world of slavery, despite the fact that he had lived it uh, in a very real way. This portrait that we're looking at here was made three years after France declared a universal emancipation across its empire. The artist, a white Frenchman by the name of Anne-Louis Yerode de rousseau Trioson, and it's fun to watch the closed captioning just sort of wrestle with that, uh, was a student of the famed neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David. Neoclassicalism 
uh, was very popular during the French Revolution. David and his students drew on what they considered to be classical tropes or styles, largely drawn from the Renaissance, to heighten the grandeur and therefore the political legitimacy of the French Revolution. By drawing on tradition, they could say that both they were establishing a new world order while also not making a full break from the past, but rather selecting the best from the past. Ballet, shown in th a three quarters pose, typically reserved for nobility and royalty, dressed in an outfit typical of a delegate to the National Assembly, leans on the white marble bust of the Enlightenment philosopher Guillaume Thomas Reynal. Reynal was not just any Enlightenment era philosopher. He was a key contributor to the great encyclopedia project that sought to assemble as much human knowledge as possible. His History of the Two Indies, Histoire de Zinde, was one of the first French books to critique slavery and French colonialism, and Reynal himself advocated for the abolition of slavery. By the time of the revolution, he was retired and would pass away in 1796, the year before Roussy Crisson immortalized him as a marble bust. In white, because Renaissance and Enlightenment era Europeans assumed that the Romans and Greeks had left their marble unpainted, not realizing that in fact, the paint had just simply worn off. Art historians have examined various juxtapositions in this painting, including between Ballet's black skin and the white of the marble, the classical sharp forehead given to Reynal versus the markedly sloped forehead given to Ballet, uh, which was being adopted into scientific racism as a marker of low intelligence used ironically by the painter here. Uh, the formal pose of a gentleman and official garb in which Reynal is presented with the tropics, a tropical landscape lurking in the background. The general assumption is that Rousset Triosson produced the portrait to argue for the universality of the French Revolution ideas of liberté, fraternité, égalité, liberty, brotherhood, and equality, and that by pursuing service to the French state, any man, no matter where he came from, and man, really, could come came from, could become French or free. It is one cool piece of propaganda, promising modern liberty built on ancient precedent. It also turns out to have been painted at the pinnacle of Ballet's career. He lost his seat in 1797. A few years later, he did get a position as a gendarme or police officer and joined an expedition of 1802, which was sent to colonial Haiti to unseat Toussaint Louverture and to reclaim French control over the island. During the expedition, he was arrested and sent back to France, where he, like Louverture and many others who opposed the French state during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte, died in prison. But it's such a cool painting that Rousseau Triosson made of ballet. It shows up on course posters and textbooks. It's even the cover art for volume E of the Norton Anthology of World Literature, uh, the gold standard uh, in English classes, English lit classes across uh, the country. Uh, this volume covers the age of revolutions, the romantic poets, realist authors such as Leo Tolstoy, Anton Chekhov, and Henrik Ibsen. Representation matters, and the Norton Anthology duly includes a proclamation from the Haitian Revolution issued by Jean-Jacques Dessalines in its section on revolutionary contexts, and we'll be visiting that proclamation later on. But the 12-page overview included in the Norton Anthology on, in, quote, an age of revolutions in Europe and the Americas contains exactly zero reference to the Haitian Revolution uh, that promoted ballet and forced France to abolish slavery preferring to center the industrial French and American revolutions, all key to what we think of what it means to be modern, to work for wages, to consume factory-made goods, to vote for representatives, to sort ourselves into liberals and moderates and conservatives, to center politics around ideas about the popular will, private property, and who can be considered a citizen, all important items. But what happens, and this is our question for today, what happens when we allow, when we deliberately push to include Haiti and its revolution into the story of the age of revolutions? When we see it as part and parcel of the formation of the modern world? When in addition to representation, we work on inclusion? What new questions and perspectives does this inclusion of Haiti bring about? What ways are we made more conscious of the limit of the age of revolutions, the way the public sphere Sphere birthed new ideas about racism, disparity, and who is considered civilized, while also re remaking the political order in the Americas. How does our timeline shift? Are we still at an upward arc of progress? Or are we all too aware that liberty, equality, and siblinghood are ideals for which we have to fight anew in every generation? The story of the Haitian Revolution begins in the 1400s. 
By the 1450s, Portuguese merchants seeking people to do domestic work and to labor on sugar farms established the Atlantic slave trade with kingdoms along the Western African coast, particularly Congo. While slavery had long existed in West and West Central Africa, key legal changes, slave status would be inheritable from mother to child, enslaved people could be sold apart from family members, no legal connection between enslaved people and the land on which they lived, strict limits on what could be owned uh, within slavery if you are enslaved, legal and social limits on what freed people could do and achieve made slavery in the Atlantic and Europe qualitatively different, a process historians call chattelization. Around 13 million women, men, and children would be sold into the Atlantic slave trade. Enslavers would send most to the Americas, linking up with a similar chattelization process that began with Christopher Columbus in 1492 that would enslave over 1 million Native Americans, who would often also be transported across the Atlantic to Europe, the Caribbean, or elsewhere in the Americas. Columbus, eager to find a path to Asia and various other things, would be delighted by the gold and the people he found on an island he called Hispaniola, which is just peeking down here. Um, but some of the native Taino referred to as Aiti, a word meaning mountains. After the Spanish, supported by local allies and using native and African workers, uh, took control of and started to exploit silver mines in Mexico and Peru, their attention drifted from Hispaniola and its capital city of Santo Domingo. Here, and then Mexico's here, Peru's here. But Spain's European rivals, particularly the Dutch, English and French, though joined by the Danes and the Swedes and various others, continue, continued to see Santo Domingo and Hispaniola and the rest of the Caribbean as the, quote, gateway to the Indies and the path they needed to follow to access the gold and silver so vital to world trade and local European power. As they carved out colonial enclaves across the region, they found that growing sugar returned robust profits. The colonizers br developed brutal new forms of labor management and paid handsomely for enslaved workers. The prize in the whole system was the French colony on the western end of Hispaniola, Saint-Domingue, a Gallicized or Frenchified version of Santo Domingo. The Pearl of the Antilles, according to writers who could travel there and then leave freely, its economic productivity supported opera houses, a lively theater scene, and scientific experiments featuring that brand new invention, the hot air balloon. The image you're seeing here is an advertisement for the sale of enslaved violinists who would play in the theaters and the opera houses of colonial Haiti. All of this was supported by the labor of several hundred thousand enslaved workers, 400,000 of whom were still alive in 1791. These workers produced 40% of the Atlantic world's sugar, half of its coffee, decent amounts of cotton and indigo and cacao from which we get chocolate, when these items were not cheap bulk commodities, but rather luxuries. Despite Mexico and Peru having literal silver mines in Brazil, gold and diamond mines, colonial Haiti in the 1780s was the most economically productive colony in the world, all in a colony about the same size as Maryland, responsible for 40% of France's overseas trade, essentially paying for the French fleet when France was a major world power. What do you do when you're living in a police state where every move is watched, especially in the towns and cities, when you're confronted with torture and inhumanity, where you're on your one day off each week, uh, you're expected to grow the food you eat, sometimes five, 10 miles away from where you're typically living, where you know few people who speak your language, recognize the status you had in the before times, before the crossing. You live, you survive, you create. New ideas growing out of past contexts and experiences start during the crossing. Upon arrival, you find people who share your language. You learn the common tongue, the Creole. You find that your fellow citizens or your fellow captives use enslavers icons and symbols to access spiritual power, but subvert them. That's St. Peter with the keys, but also Legba, the Loire, or the spirit of the crossroads. St. Patrick, but also Dambala, the Holy Mother, but also Ezeli. You pray for protection, for power, you leave out little things, cigar and rum are preferred, so that Baron Samdi and Mama Brigitte and Baron Simitar and the rest of the Gede family protect the bodies of your loved ones and their spirits can return to Guinea so they aren't turned into zombies who are slaves forever with not even death um, receiving escape. And you hear stories of Makandal who succeeded in poisoning his enemies. And when the colonists tried to burn him at the stake, he turned into a mosquito and flew away brought from one continent where Congo and Dahomey were far apart, where Yoruba and Akan were different, working alongside on an island to grow stuff that gets shipped to a third place entirely, 
there are travel narratives, management manuals, and insurance, do insurance documents, the first ones, written about you. There's hope that maybe you can be safe, that maybe you can get away, that maybe you can help your loved ones, that maybe you can be part of that 2% who get pep papers that say you're free. Three quick stories from Colonial Haiti. Story one, Telemach was born with slave status in the Danish colony of St. Thomas and enslaved to a ship's captain. He learned English, French, and Spanish, but when he was 13 or 14, about the typical age, the people would first be sent to the fields. The captain sold him to a merchant who then sold him to a sugar camp owner, who we would sometimes call a plantation owner or a planter or an habitant in Saint-Domingue. Telemach immediately developed terrible seizures, one after the other. The sugar camp owner, the enslaver, demanded a refund, and sooner rather than later, Telemach was back with the ship's captain. The seizures, they immediately cleared up, but the captain didn't try to sell them again. The second story. The colonial newspaper regularly ran advertisements telling enslavers to keep an eye out for people pursuing liberation, or as they saw it, running away or marinage, a word that comes from a Spanish term for escaped cattle. It's not a coincidence that chattelization and cattle come from the same Latin root. The newspaper also ran lists of people the police or the militia had found and sent to the local jail, as well as notices about colonists getting ready to return to France so other colonists could try to collect on loans because everyone was in massive debt if you were a free colonist. Sometimes enslavers waited a few weeks before placing an advertisement. It cost money after all, it required time to go into town. Sometimes workers came back after a few days anyway. They were visiting family or they just needed a break or something and they stepped away. Sometimes it was a manager left in charge of the work camp anyway, who wasn't watching things too closely. But this one time, a colonist had a prosperous commercial fishing business that included four enslaved fishermen. One morning, the colonist woke up to discover that the four men had taken off with the boat, the fishing tackle, a couple crates of food, and a few vats of wine. The colonist immediately went to town to announce their escape. We don't know the rest of the story, but I like to think that they made it. They had a good time with the fishing tackle and the food and the wine before finding safe harbor. The third story. France had abolished slavery within its own borders way back in 1315, with King Louis X announcing that any enslaved person who set foot in its borders would be free, because to be French means to be free. Think of our word franchise and franchisement, which comes from franc or French. They exempted the colonies so they could profit from the sugar revolution and carved out additional exemptions so colonists could bring enslaved people to France for training in a trade, which was often a legal fiction uh, to have domestic workers who were enslaved. By the 1770s and 1780s, the French public and policymakers wanted to appear humane and enlightened, including implementing reforms to slavery as you know, it was being practiced in the colonies. The usual proposals included things such as prohibiting the use of the whip and allowing the enslaved an extra day each week to grow food. They also passed laws that enabled the enslaved to report cruel and unusual punishments meted out by enslavers. Nicolas Lejeune owned a coffee camp where he kept the enslaved in terrible conditions for Saint-Domingue. Like other enslavers in Saint-Domingue wrote about how cruel and terrible Nicolas Lejeune was. Because of the conditions, many enslaved workers died but Lejeune, familiar with the stories of Macandal, who was executed 30 years prior, suspected poison. So he tortured the workers for intelligence, which he then, of course, found, because when you're under torture, you say the things to make the torture stop. Some of the enslaved from his camp, aware of the new laws, denounced him to the authorities. A lower court even found him guilty. Enslavers who considered their authority over people they considered property to be total, but were terrified that it wasn't, protested. They intimidated the courts into essentially acquitting Lejeune. The reform spread from France had crashed into the reality of power politics in Saint-Domingue, much to the frustration of reformers. The enslaved continued to pass around stories about how the king wanted to help them, but local colonists, local enslavers, were blocking them. By the start, by 1789, the start of the French Revolution, colonial society in Haiti consisted of three groups, each with their own internal divisions and their own problems. At the top of the social ladder were white colonists, from the governor on down to demobilized soldiers and would-be entrepreneurs hoping to get lucky. They made up about 5% of the population, roughly divided between landowning enslavers and poorer white colonists who worked as clerks, soldiers, itinerant peddlers or handymen, or overseers. The enslaved mocked this latter group by calling them petit bron, or little whites. But it's notable that by the 1780s, even these little whites could enjoy being called monsieur, or Madame, which would not have been possible in France at the time. 
This is what W.B. Du Bois refers to as the wages of whiteness. The next group were free people of color, 6% of the population, a few of whom were very wealthy. Others never left the camp in which they'd been enslaved. Having white family members, while it worked out for people such as Thomas Alexandre Dumas, uh, who became the first major general of the French army uh, to be of African descent and was the inspiration for his son, Alexandre Dumas' books, The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. Um, it didn't work out for everyone. Uh, and by the 1770s, not only could free colonists of color not enter professions such as medicine, the law, or being a military officer, this would change during the revolution, and couldn't wear certain types of clothing, but they could be referred, but they would be referred to as the so-called le dit, la nomme, rather than monsieur or madame, and theaters and opera houses were segregated. Uh, in one of the towns I studied for my dissertation, uh, the wealthiest person in town was a man who had formerly been enslaved named Jean-Louis Labbé, who owned the theater uh, in the town, but he could not sit in the white section of it. Many wealthy free people of color were also enslavers because that's how one obtained social status and provided for one's family. Uh, though those with more modest amounts of wealth often had enslaved family members, they would endeavor to free through purchase. Then came the enslaved close to 90% of the population. An increasing number in the 1780s had been born in Africa, typically near the kingdoms of Dahomey in West Africa and Congo in West Central Africa. Many of the new arrivals were young men with military experience, this would prove important. Some of the enslaved were born in the colony in families that stretched back a few generations. A few enslaved men held elite positions as crew foremen, coachmen, pastry chefs, or wig makers. It was a French colony after all. Uh, the coachmen had the greatest freedom of movement because they were driving carriages around and then stood around and gossiped with each other uh, while the people who were they were driving were in the meetings. The foremen uh, grew frustrated with the poor management of many of the camps. And we have at least two examples of enslaved foremen writing to the absentee uh, landlord or proprietor in France, telling him to fire the manager and put the foreman in charge because he could run the sugar camp much more profitably and much more efficiently than the manager who was cheating the owner. Uh, some of the enslaved, oh yes, field and housework each came with their own dangers and terrors. Uh, some with long experience in the colony or from the Congo were Catholic, uh, very strictly so sometimes. Some were Muslim, many drew on voodoo, which as it was forming, for power and resilience. They found Taino artifacts in caves and fields and wondered about the native peoples who had lived there. In the early generations of colonial Haiti, uh, where the Spanish uh, genocide against uh, the Taino and the forced labor had been at its worst. There were a few people who claimed to be of Taino descent. Uh, this is much debated among historians, but the image of the Taino uh, and the desire to, or the recognition of uh, both being subject to colonialism, both the enslaved Africans and the Taino uh, proved to be very powerful in the Haitian imagination as we'll be talking about down the road. Aiti means mountains, and San Domingue was a mountainous place, which provided refuge for those who had liberated themselves from slavery. Sometimes the self-liberated would hide near camps to keep connected and obtain supplies. Sometimes they would go far into the mountains between the French and Spanish colonies on the island. Other colonizers marveled at San Domingue's economic productivity, not wealth, very little of the wealth stayed there, but the productivity, particularly the sugar produced in the colony's northern plain, colonists in Santo Domingo, Jamaica, Havana, Cuba, petitioned their governments for more support, either to boost their own sugar industry or to keep Saint-Domingue sugar out of European and North American markets. But then came the French Revolution with a fiscal crisis, a governmental crisis, and a food crisis, with a major sense that things needed to change and fast, but what things? Why revolution happens is one of the great historical questions, and not one we're going to answer in total today. But about 60 years ago, a political scientist named James Davies suggested that it's a combination of rising individual expectations and falling perceptions of well-being. It's not necessarily when you're Dennis the communist peasant or the Sindaco anarchist peasant, uh, just kind of living in King Arthur's Britain, repressed by the power structure, but when things are getting better for Dennis and then he suddenly cuts short. Uh, there are additional elements that are important, including perceptions that the current order is not getting the job done, frustrated efforts to reform the system, cracks among political elites and external shocks. But what we see as we look at colonial Haiti is that each major group in society had something to gain and something to lose. 
For the white landed elite, they wanted to gain the right to trade freely with the United States, their best supply of grain, and their best opportunity to get out of debt. Uh, and they wanted their interests represented to the new French National Assembly. They wanted to make sure that no law got passed that threatened their total and complete authority over the people they enslaved. Poorer white men were excited about the promise of equality that we see in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, uh, particularly when it came to voting and social status, and wanted to make sure that they could enjoy the vote, have access to political power and positions, and that free men of color would be shut out, that the social distinctions would protect them. Free men of color saw the revolution as a chance to throw off discriminatory race-based laws to assert leadership in their community, uh, where women often held at least as much as wealth as they did, and to likewise enjoy the vote and political and professional positions. The ending of slavery was not yet on the radar of most. The enslaved likewise had a range of political desires, including implementation of rumored reforms that would abolish the use of the whip, but many plans and hopes centered on the garden plots where they grew their food and that perhaps these lands could be the foundation for building anew. During the years of 1789, 1791, um, the colonists and the residents of colonial Haiti uh, fiercely debated and fought over the meaning of the revolution. Uh, and the colonial police state broke down. Stochastic terror, including street brawls and acts of violence occurred as a royal government uh, tried to keep the sugar flowing as the rest of the free residents jockeyed for positions. The governor was driven out of the capital by white radicals and half of the colonial garrison uh, deserted. In August, 1791, two rebellions erupted. In Port-au-Prince in the West Province, free people of color uh, rose up against the white elite um, arguing for an end to race-based discrimination, demanding full and political and civil rights. At the same time, in the Northern Plain, a group of enslaved workers rose up, uh, burned work camps, and seized territory. Their initial weapons were machetes and other farm tools, uh, bolstered by religious amulets and a belief that they would be okay. The colonial military, severely depleted by the revolution and the tumults, could not put down the rebellion. The National Assembly in Paris was always at least a few months behind due to travel times. And in May of 1791, it proclaimed that certain free men of color could enjoy political rights. When the news reached the colony in July of 1791, that just uh, continued to agitate the civil disturbances and white colonists. The August rebellions reached Paris, the National Assembly in Paris repealed the decree. This pattern would repeat often throughout the revolution as sailing and slower forms of communication meant that the National Assembly was responding to the facts on the ground that were at least six weeks old and their answer took another six weeks to arrive. Over the next year of 1792, rebellions of enslaved people spread across the South and the West. Uh, one, of, one that I've studied is one that happened just outside of Leogan where a coffee planter who had enslaved a few people, but also um, purchased his spouse and children out of slavery, uh, led a major rebellion that drew on Congolese uh, elements. He proclaimed himself to be the godson of the Virgin Mary and to be a prophetess um, and would lead an army of about 7,000 insurgents uh, to take a large area of territory. Um, Commissioners sent from France quickly found their best allies to be among free people of color like Belay, who rose quickly in the French National Guard, helping to put down the rebellions, but never quite succeeding. And the colonial government deported white conservatives and radicals alike back to France. The rebels themselves, the formerly enslaved insurgents were pursuing self-liberation, however, are dubious about revolutionary ideas like republicanism. By this point, France has executed the king. Um, or was about to, and popular will and all that sort of thing. And there's this famous quote from Micaiah, who's one of the leaders of the insurgents, that he gives in June 1793, um, where he says, I am the subject of three kings, of the king of Congo, master of all of the blacks, of the king of France, who represents my father, of the king of Spain, who represents my mother. Spain was offering some off, um, support to the insurgents. These three kings are the descendants of those who, led by a star, came to adore God made man. And so what we see is a distinct uh, element of royalism, that they're rebelling in the name of the king, which has certain echoes to Latin American rebellions um, all the way up through the wars of independence. 
When France declared war against Britain and Spain in early 1793, the rivals jumped at the chance to seize Saint-Domingue. Spain formed an alliance with the rebellion in the North Province, eventually supplying weapons and auxiliary commissions for leading rebels to become generals in the Spanish army, auxiliary generals. Spain, Britain invaded from the coast, promising to protect slavery. When the city of Cap Francais burned in June of 1793, um, the commissioners promised freedom to any enslaved person who joined their cause. This offer wasn't novel even in the history of the Atlantic world, but it proved to be momentous. Two years later, the lead commissioner from France, um, a 28-year-old secret abolitionist named Leger Felicité Sontanax, abolished slavery in the North Province, extending the decree to the West and the South over the next few months. Though after the British uh, invade at the end of the year, that's made largely moot where the British maintain slavery. What kind, of Sontanac, what kind of emancipation did Sontanax have in mind uh, in the places where his emancipation took effect, largely in the north part of the colony? He knew that his position with the government depended on taxes and sugar continuing to flow from colonial Haiti. And so while he outlawed certain punishments, the scheme he set up to replace slavery looked a lot like serfdom. The freed farm workers would be required to stay in the camps, keep working in sugar, the most dangerous crop, and would in exchange receive a share of the profits. When France confirmed Sontanax's proclamation, which had really been won through the rebellions for liberation, most French colonial governors continued the plantation system as best they could. There's this whole wave of different commissioners and officials who come, but all with the idea and the eye of maintaining the plantation system, uh, even after slavery. Meanwhile, as the Spanish were completing their conquest of the North and the British were solidifying their hold on the South and West, a prominent rebel decided to abandon the Spanish. Toussaint Breda had been born with slave status, secured his liberty as a young man, uh, could read, and had close family members still in slavery. He appears to have joined the rebellion a few weeks in, and his tactical and strategic brilliance soon elevated him to a position of leadership. His chosen name, Louverture, uh, or the opening, had a potent symbolism, and his decision to side with the French Republic was critical. Uh, in mid-1795, Spain made peace with France and the remaining rebel leaders chose exile in the Spanish empire, helping Toussaint work fighting for the French Republic consolidate the North. By March of 1796, Louverture is the deputy governor of the colony. By the end of that year, the British are on the defensive. It's in the next year that Bellet's portrait is made um, that we see again here alongside another portrait of Toussaint Louverture. A brief note, all portraits that we have of Toussaint Louverture were made uh, after uh, his death. We don't have any drawings or etchings or anything like that uh, made during his lifetime. Across the, 17, the late 1790s, even as reactionary forces in France uh, conspired to roll back the abolition of slavery and Belay lost his seat just after this portrait is made, Louverture is consolidating his power in Saint-Domingue. After Sontenac's named Louverture commander in chief, Louverture forced him to leave the colony. When the British withdrew, Louverture signed a trade and non-aggression treaty with them to procure much needed supplies and to avoid reinvasion. He began diplomacy with the Adams administration, second president of the United States, and he continued the labor re regime Sontenac's pioneered, giving abandoned farms to his top deputies. Classic maneuver in revolutions. In 1799, the conservatives in France succeeded in a coup in installing Napoleon Bonaparte as head of state. The colonies lost the right of representation in France and plans began to resecure Saint-Domingue. Louverture, now feeling pretty secure himself in the, his control of the entire colony, but with many enemies in France, uh, ordered the army to impose forced labor in the sugar camps, threatening workers with the ball and chain and giving the best properties, again, to top deputies to secure their loyalty. Many of the liberated, now euphemistically called cultivators in government documents, voted with their feet and fled to their mountain gardens, uh, establishing new villages, communal uh, properties um, being worked together by family units known as Laku, L-A-K-O-U. L -A -K -O -U. In 1801, Louverture, by most historians' accounts, overreached. He invaded and occupied Santo Domingo in violation of French orders and announced a project to draft a constitution for the colony. Bonaparte initially named Louverture to be Captain General of Saint-Domingue, but then retracted the decision. When the Constitution Louverture's was finished, it named Louverture Governor for Life, which Bonaparte saw as an affront. Unfortunately, uh, Louverture also then faced a rebellion from his nephew and an initial peace treaty between France and Britain. A peace treaty between France and Britain enabled essentially a declaration of war from France against Saint-Domingue. The 1802 expedition, uh, led by Bonaparte's brother-in-law, 
uh, Leclerc and involving a massive force of 30,000 troops, which was huge at the time, was supported by many free people of color who had found themselves crosswise with the Louverture government and were thus living in France, uh, as well as initially supported by former lieutenants of Louverture still in Saint-Domingue, such as Jean-Jacques Dessalines. Ballet supports it as well. Louverture is soon tricked and arrested and was deported to France. But then two months after he's deported, news of the reestablishment of slavery in the French colony of Guadeloupe reached Saint-Domingue. Key leaders, featuring a range of backgrounds and political perspectives, including people who were still in slavery at the start of the revolution, all the way to people uh, who had been educated in France, financed, bankrolled by their wealthy white fathers, uh, unite in opposition. They established themselves in the mountains and waited for the French army in the lowland port cities to die of yellow fever, a classic technique of Caribbean warfare. The rebels now led by Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Alexandre Patrion, Dessalines, uh, I believe was still enslaved or very recently free at the time of the revolution. Patrion had been educated in France, defeat the French army at Vertier in November of 1803. After two years of particularly brutal warfare with mass executions carried out by the French army, the insurgents are victorious. Dessalines declares Haiti's independence on the 1st of January, 1804, which is still celebrated as Haitian Independence Day. Uh, the bicentennial happened, oh gosh, when I was there, but I, that's 16 years ago now. Uh, Haiti becomes the second independent state in the Americas, the first to be led by people of African descent. I want to pause here to briefly consider these two images. Um, and to return to the theme of which we opened up with about how we illustrate history. The, the etching that we have here of gleeful um, Africans uh, in top hat and waistcoat, uh, hanging a French soldier um, with more hangings happening uh, was a very popular image in the early 19th century. There are lots and lots of images uh, that could be categorized, have been categorized by historians as images of black vengeance, of these fears of what happens if, if uh, the white populace ever lets down its guard. The other image is a much more recent one, um, inspired by the recent movement for black lives, um, looking at the terror with which the enslaved and the self-liberating lived every day, where the French soldier was not a passive victim, but a terrorizer, someone who struck fear into the community, who chased down people and bayoneted them. And so, what we have here is often textbooks drawing on things that are in the public domain, or it's easy to get permissions, will often still use these early 19th century images without using corresponding images painted by Haitian or artists um, or Haitian American artists that reframe the power dynamics of so much of the colonial history and so much of the revolutionary history. By the end, and by the time Dessalines proclaims independence, the coalition army the Dessalines leads is referring to itself, interestingly, as the indigenous army, Armée Indigène. And he thought that the name is just a reference to the fact that many rebels, unlike the French soldiers, uh, were born in the colony, should be put to rest by the fact that Dessalines and his supporters call their new nation Haiti, or Haiti, or Haiti, reclaiming the Taino name. In the June 1804 declaration that's included in the Norton Anthology, Dessalines declares in a proclamation called Liberty or Death, cute Patrick Henry, quote, I have saved my country, I have avenged America. And so there are a few 19th century impacts worth noting as we think about this big question of how does the Haitian Revolution um, shape our view of the age of revolutions? The first one is Haitian anti-colonialism. While a few French authors had critiqued colonialism and critiqued slavery while others sought to justify it, uh, notable critics include Renan, Voltaire, uh, the Haitian state uh, financed the production of many histories, many political tracts, polemical tracts, uh, connecting uh, Haiti's civilization with that of Egypt and critiquing colonialism for its barbarity and savagery. One of the most notable, which has received lots of attention in the last few years from scholars, was written by the Baron de Vaste, who was supported by King Henry Christophe of Haiti, and it's called The Colonial System Unveiled, where he recounts the abuses that Columbus and the Spanish perpetrated against the Taino, the abuses of slavery, 
and justifies the Haitian Revolution as a war of liberation. And so we see that in the early Haitian state, even as uh, Haitian leaders continue to use the military to try to continue forced labor, to continue sugar production, um, they are also very aware too of the, the horrors of colonialism. It's also worth noting that the Haitian uh, populace continues to vote with their feet, going to the mountains to establish uh, garden plots and what we consider to be sort of family farms, um, but mountain villages. Um, and even as Britain and France are retooling and gearing up for a new wave of imperialism based on claims of being civilizing forces, Haitian authors rebut their um, grandiose claims. What we also see is various forms of geopolitical impact. Uh, the most notable is that in 1803, as the invasion's not going well, the uh, historians debate the causation of this, but Napoleon decides that he needs cash more than he needs an American empire, and so agrees to sell the Louisiana Purchase, uh, newly acquired from Spain, long story, uh, to the United States, which uh, essentially doubles the size of the United States uh, at the time and makes it much easier to expand slavery into these territories, um, especially in these few years immediately after the invention of the cotton gin. So cotton and slavery and the domestic slave trade uh, all expand due to this. Uh, Haiti itself uh, supports Venezuelan rebels uh, during their bid for independence. And Haiti faces moving goalposts for recognition. Uh, they try to be recognized by the Vatican as an effort to be recognized as an independent state uh, by various other countries, uh, seeing religion you know, because the Europeans say that religion is the key thing to, you know, welcome one into the family of nations. Um, but uh, they move the goalposts saying, well, you have to be civilized and set up all of these sort of different proclamations of what it means to be civilized, with the idea that Haiti can never quite make it into the family of nations. France, in exchange for recognizing Haiti's um, independence and dropping the threat of reinvasion, extracts a huge indemnity uh, that Haiti is paying off with about 30% of uh, its national income or you know, state income, I should say, uh, all the way up until about the 1910s. There's also new phases of slavery in general where um, a lot of the countries in the Americas continue to be slaveholding and slaving nations, including Brazil, the United States, uh, still Mexico for a while, much of Spanish South America, certainly uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico as colonies of Spain. And uh, restrictions on the enslaved become more severe. Slave rebellions, uh, bids for liberation become larger. Um, and there's great worries about the impact of the continuing slave trade. Are we going to keep bringing in these people who get captured in these wars uh, who then have military experience? Are we gonna bring them into our colonies? What's the danger there? There's fears of contagion. Uh, and they don't want to let Haitian merchants into their ports, lest these stories of rebellion and liberation spread. Louverture becomes an inspiration and a byword, word, which I'll be discussing more next month as we talk about the impact and the run-up to the Civil War. But a brief note. So Telemaque, he of the seizures, who we talked about some time ago, uh, the ship captain, he, who he remains enslaved to, will eventually retire to Charleston, South Carolina, in 1797, Telemaque wins a lottery, uh, which gets him enough freedom or enough money to purchase his freedom. Um, he takes the name of Denmark VC. Uh, VC was the name of the ship captain, Denmark for Denmark, the colonizer of St. Thomas. Uh, and he becomes a prominent leader in the local free community of color. In the 1820s, however, he's accused of conspiring to start a slave rebellion, allegedly to be supported by the Haitian Navy, which is, there's this huge fear, this huge panic. The Haitian Navy is just waiting off the coast of Charleston, and he's executed. This is a statue uh, commemorating Denmark Vesey for his contributions to Charleston life, uh, including helping establish Mother Emanuel AME Church. During the 19th century and early 20th century, European powers used this myth of themselves as civilizing nations to help justify the establishment of um, colonies and territories in Africa, in Asia, 
uh, Britain will quite famously use the fact that they abolished the slave trade and encouraged other European nations to do so to argue that they are colonizing Africa with the best of intentions. Um, and that Europeans lead the world in science and civilization and knowledge, and this will be a great benefit to the world. He should argue otherwise. World War I and the massive death tolls of World War I and the horrors who, which then get you know, broadcast around the world, uh, let's just say raise questions about European supremacy and claims to civilization. And Haiti and the Haitian Revolution becomes a key historical memoir or key historical mirror in a couple of different ways. One of them, uh, the first uh, is by a Harvard historian named Lothrop Stoddard. Uh, Lothrop Stoddard will write about the Haitian Revolution as a warning to imperial powers, where he says, look, we need to redouble our efforts to hold on to the colonies uh, because if we're going to maintain white supremacy, we have to watch colonial peoples like a hawk. We cannot assume that they're simple-minded. We cannot assume that they're dumb, which is flattering in a weird kind of way, but also deeply white supremacist. Um, 20 years later, a young Marxist born in Trinidad named C.L.R. James will take up Stoddard's history and write his own history of the Haitian Revolution called the Black Jacobins, uh, where he also points to the Haitian Revolution, uh, but in an inspirational way, where he says, hey, colonized peoples of the world in Africa and Asia, let Haiti be an inspiration to you. You can throw off European oppressors. Here's how this worked in Haiti. Bolstered some by the Black Jacobins, um, but also driving out of uh, domestic concerns in Haiti. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, coming out of a US occupation that lasted for several years, and that also included Woodrow Wilson seizing all of the gold out of the Haitian treasury, and sending it to France for safekeeping? Anyway, um, Haitian nationalists are looking back to the colonial past, trying to find stories to celebrate. And they grasp onto the stories of the Maroons, of the people who self-liberated. And they see the Maroons as the forerunners of the Haitian Revolution. Um, and under the government of Papa Doc Duvalier, um, they commemorate the statue of the unknown Maroon, who is blowing the conch shell to help inspire everyone to rebellion. We find, us pesky historians, that the people who had already self-liberated before the revolution mostly just tried to stay out of it, to not get caught up in the fighting, though there were a few uh, who would join in the fight. But we see these different ways that the history of Haiti gets used, gets discussed, uh, gets thought about, that really connect to these main ideas of the age of revolutions, including what does it mean to end slavery? What rights do the emancipated have? Who gets to enjoy liberty and how? And think about our current discussions around the 13th Amendment um, and mass incarceration and prison labor. What does it mean to pursue a free and just society? Um, Haiti and many post-colonial societies, including the United States, have uh, incredible levels of wealth and income disparity. How do we use history to justify current inequalities or to try to forget uh, unfortunate aspects of our past? What does it mean to be a citizen? And so some thoughts I want to leave you with as we wrap up today, and I'm looking forward to taking your questions, are first, learning global history matters. The, the Haitian Revolution is a key moment in the history of the African diaspora, in the history of slavery that erasing or ignoring the past leaves us ill-equipped to deal with our present challenges. And that ignoring the Haitian Revolution, again, means ignoring the politics of emancipation, which were politics that had to be dealt with um, across the Americas, across the Indian Ocean, um, even in Canada. It ignore, means ignoring the politics of reconstruction and of civil rights writ large. The civil rights movement was not just something that happened in the 1950s and 1960s, but has been an ongoing continuing process that stretches back to the beginnings of the Atlantic slave trade, if not before. And so if I can leave you with anything, it's with this, that we don't gain anything by running from this history. 
that we should consider carefully who we glorify and why, but that it's the opposite of carefully learning the history in all of its complexity when we glorify people. Um, that by learning history and its complexity, it prepares us to be patient with ambiguity and considerate of humanity. Learning from the past prepares us to build a better future. Thank you, and I'll take your questions. Pass around the mic if you have a question. They get extra. I'll get the ball rolling. Okay. Yeah, they don't get extra credit for it. Thanks very much, Dr. Sever. That was a fascinating uh, talk. There was one thing that you touched on. I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about it, uh, about which was the um, the culture of the practice of voodoo, the role it played in the revolution. Um, I was struck that. The way you describe voodoo is that um, it, it, it comes out of the material circumstances of slavery or many aspects of it do, especially the um, what you mentioned about zombies. And I'm wondering to what extent does the practice of voodoo change in an independent meeting? And do, do, the, do the cultural practices of voodoo change in regard to the changing material circumstances or does the past of slavery continue to loom really large. Right, so thank you for that, uh, Dr. Fisher. And so, I mean, this the short answer to your question is, of course, it's complicated and we don't have enough sources. Um, but what we see is that the, the definition of who, of what zombification means, of becoming a zombie, this idea that you are a drudge, you are a laborer for your life, uh, continues well into the 20th century. Uh, that it's only in the United States, and there's some interesting cultural aspects to American capitalism and whatever else, that we get this idea of the infected bite and see zombification as a virus or as a plague, um, whereas in voodoo it maintains to a large degree the same sort of image of someone who's captured your body, um, but and that blocks your soul from returning to the land of the ancestors. Um, so what I wasn't able to really get into too much is that when we're looking at these different rites, that voodoo is many things, um, and the people are drawing on cultural practices that are developed in the Kingdom of Congo, where Christianity is present before Columbus crosses the Atlantic. The Portuguese um, have missionaries, and Congo becomes officially a Christian kingdom. And so you have this syncretism, this blending of different uh, religious ideas happening already in Congo, um, as well as in West Africa. So the uh, Petwo here under rites tends to be stuff that historians and sociologists of religion uh, trace back to Congo and Congolese ideas, whereas Rada uh, tends to be more West African, Dahomeyan ideas. And the other thing to keep in mind too is um, sometimes people will look at voodoo uh, as very foreign or alien, but you know, as historians discuss, we discuss organized religion and popular religion. And in the United States, we talk about and we use popular religion all the time, but we just tend to call it superstition or holidays that involve candy, uh, <laughs> where Halloween um, practices as knocking on wood to avoid bad luck, all these things stem from European or African or Latin American popular religions. Um, and so for Haitians, uh, contemporary Haitians, some of them take voodoo very seriously. Um, Haitian Protestants will wholly reject voodoo largely. And for others, it's what most of us consider Halloween to be. Thank you. Voodoo is so central to a discussion of the Caribbean that we have scheduled two separate presentations on voodoo later this semester. One is on October the 9th, and one is on October 22nd. So if you're interested in hearing more about that topic, we have two different guest speakers addressing it. OK, other questions? All right, I don't all right. All right. <laughs> when did most nations really start to recognize me and drop the whole we can't recognize that they're not civilized routine? Well, one more time, the question kind of broke up a little bit. Okay. 
when did most nations drop the whole you're not civilized so we can't recognize you bit? So yeah, no, that's a great question. And my question is, have they? <laughs> You know, so when we talk about Haiti in the popular press these days, um, it's often, and I'll get more into this into one of my October talks, but it's often in the context of poverty porn. Um, and Haitians uh, get very offended, or at least they did in 2003, 2004 when I lived there. But I think even still these days, when uh, people from outside, Borgonio, uh, come and take photos of them without permission of just like, oh, look at these miserable Haitians who are living here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we refer to Haiti as a fourth world country. Uh, far too many journalists still talk about Haiti as going from the wealthiest colony in the world to the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, uh, which insinuates that the rebellion was a bad thing. Um, yeah, and we refer to it as a republic of NGOs where there are all these non-governmental operations and why can't Haiti ever get its act together and so on and so forth and that it needs a strong hand from the international community. And so, yeah, I don't know that we've ever recognized Haitian sovereignty. You know, I mean, on a formal level, uh, it was during the US Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was the first person to dispatch a US ambassador to Haiti. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of those other recognitions happened in the 1860s, but when the US invaded and occupied the country in 1915, 1917, no one really said boo about it um, across the European community, the League of Nations, et cetera. Uh, it's just like, yeah, the United States is taking care of its backyard um, and still seeing these, you know, to these days that the United States will intervene militarily if it sees fit. That's a good question. Other questions? Did any come in on the chat? Yes, uh, try out the new or Rob, do you have access to the, to the chat questions? I, I don't do, I don't have any questions here. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You lived in Haiti for about six months in 2003, 2004. What was your one big takeaway from that experience? Uh, so that's a really, really big, good question. Really big question. I mean, so, um, I think, I mean, there, there were a couple times that it hit me. So I'm going to tell you a couple stories. Uh, the first one came in around October of 2003, where I'm talking to this young man named Alain. Uh, we're chilling under a mango tree, shooting the breeze. I, my Creole was finally coming in so I could actually like talk to and understand people, which was great. And we were just making small chat, chat talk. And he said, I was, you know, halfway through my undergrad at the time. And he said, hey, what are you studying at university? And I said, oh, I'm studying history. And he's like, oh, do you know about the help that we gave you during the American Revolution? And sometimes history majors can be kind of know-it-alls. And so I started to pontificate in Creole about the, Fran the help that France had given the US during the American Revolution. And he says, no, 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 us here in the town of St. Mark, we sent soldiers, we sent supplies, we helped you. And in that moment, you know, my view of the world had changed, where I had previously considered Haiti to be this remote tropical place with a troubled history. And I quickly realized how closely connected it was to the history of the United States, which is something I'll be talking about uh, in October. The other moment happened in February of 2004. I was supposed to be in Haiti for about two years, um, but the political revolution or the political situation was uh, getting tense as there were various protests against the then president, Jean-Bertrand Jean Aristide. And so I'm literally sitting in a roadside cafe and we're sitting around a communal table and one of the people at the table is a young college student from Port-au-Prince from the capital where she launches into this sort of monologue about how what has been going on in Haiti with the you know fights against Aristide and Aristide pushing back and all that stuff really stems from, you know, it's the same old stuff that the Spanish started, that the French continued, that Haiti has to once again to fight for its liberation, for its chance for self-determination. And so I think the biggest things that I learned from Haiti is that we are not separate and that we are not disconnected from the past, but that we're still living in it. 
So yeah, those are my thoughts. Very good, and I'm impressed that you learned Creole. Well, when you live, I mean, I was, I, I got along pretty well in the, for the first four months where I was living with, uh, I mean, we're in a house of four guys and, you know, we're ta out talking to people every day. And then my last three months, I was the only native English, English speaker in my house. So as the Haitians say, obligé. And that was a, an interesting experience where I just became like the dumb brun who kept like dropping the rope when lowering the bucket into the cistern to get water and didn't know how to make rice, uh, where my S SAT and ACT scores really didn't matter anymore. It was what I could do, what I could contribute. So that was a good um, experience for me, but also uh, rough on my Haitian roommates. If you're watching by Zoom and have a question, please type it in the uh, question or chat box. Uh, in the meantime, any more questions from our audience and health theater? <laughs> and Dr. Tabor, I assume you also know a little French and Spanish to go along with that Creole? A little bit. Um, and I mean, there's, there's certainly been a fair amount of Spanish that has uh, been part of Creole recently, a um, fair amount of English as well. Uh, when I went back to undergrad, uh, they, the university placed me in French 201. Um, French and Creole are so similar that uh, when I go to conferences uh, with French academics, it's easier if they've been drinking um, and I can communicate to them uh, that way pretty well. Otherwise, they just kind of look askance at my French because it comes from Creole and from reading 18th century French legal documents. Uh, and so it's not exactly like speaking like a Parisian, but that's okay. I don't want to speak like a Parisian. Um, but yeah, no, it's a it's it's good in that way, but yeah, it messes you up. Um, the one thing that was fun about the language placement after you come back was the other people who got automatically placed. So if you'd been in West Africa or in France, you got placed immediately into French 321 or something, something a junior year level. Um, it was if you were in Creole or like a Creole speaking place, or if you had served in Quebec, if you'd been in French Canada, that you got placed in 201, which was just a nice slam on Quebec there. Um, yeah. Okay. Are there any questions on the on the Zoom chat? Not that I see. I'll look one more time. But nope. Okay. Well, thank you for thank you. coming today. Thank you, Dr. Tabor. We will see you again on thank October twenty eighth. So, yeah. Terrific. Thank you. It's been great to be with you.